We've spoken a lot about um, the personality of Abu Huraira um, and also of people like Kaab El Ahbar, the Jewish rabbi who became Muslim. So what this relationship tells us, or what we learn from this relationship, is that they were in fact companions of the Prophet who um, learned and who became students of other companions. And, um, and, and, and that's an interesting fact of history because it means that between companions, and we must realize that there were 124,000 companions, it's the population of a small town or city, and that was the number of companions. Obviously, they were spread across approximately two or three cities. So there were many thousands of them in Mecca, in Medina, in uh, Kufa. And um, these companions actually did interact and they were commonly, uh, would, would be commonly in each other's company. And so from Abu Huraira, we do know now that he was in fact um, in the company of Kaab al the Jewish rabbi who turned Muslim, and the founder or the inventor of many, many hundreds of Jewish and uh, Talmudic practices into the fabric of Islam. So the, 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 the dangerous um, fact that um, we, we, we see or that, that is um, the, the, the dangerous prospect that is that is raised in this fact that some scholars, some companions learned from others is that these companions who outlived the others could in fact narrate hadiths or could narrate stories of the prophet as if they were the first hand witnesses from the prophet and this is exactly what happened in the case of Abu Huraira many of the things which he heard from Kabul Akbar the Jewish rabbi stories and tales and myths and legends, he could then ascribe to the Prophet, or at the very least, people with nefarious aims, with sinister intentions, who listened, the, who listened to these stories from Abu Huraira, could, could, could ascribe them to the Prophet when they were actually Abu Huraira narrating a story he heard from Kabul Akbar, from a Jewish rabbi. So we know that that is a fact, that Abu Huraira, with 6,000 hadiths, the vast majority of hadiths coming through Abu Huraira, being a student of Kabul Akbar, is a clear and present risk and danger of Islam being infiltrated by Jewish rabbis. But I'm going to speak to you about another prominent narrator of hadith, and that is Anas bin Malik. Now, if you want to if, if, Hore, if Abu Huraira is the king of Hadith narrations, then Anas could certainly be regarded as a prince of Hadith narrations. Because Anas has got something like 2,000 something Hadiths also. Many, many, many Hadiths. And what we know now is that Anas was in fact the successor to Abu Huraira. Now Abu Huraira, some of the facts we know about them is that this guy was in service of the kings. He worked for the Umayyads. He was paid. He was on the salary role. He was an employee of the, of the Umayyads. So whenever I say that your deen, your Islam, is an Islam that was created and shaped by the kings, I'm not speaking out of my neck. I'm not making this up. These people were paid by the kings. Now I'm going to look at Anas bin Malik, another great uh, in a uh, creator of hadith stories and and, and, sto and and tales, also a beneficiary of the Umayyads, Hajjaj, the, the uh, one of the Umayyads, living in a palace in Basra. Also, these are known facts. You don't have to. I'm not making this up. This is in all hadith book hadith books or in history books. Is that? Anas bin Malik lived a wealthy man, he lived in a palace, and he is known to have been the oldest so-called um, Sahabi, of, of the prominent Sahabis, that, uh, that died approximately 90 or years after the Prophet. And so he had an extended life 
of talking about the Prophet and telling stories about the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam. But this man, uh, uh, Anas bin Malik, was no more than a child of 10 years old. And he is said to have been a servant of the Prophet at the age of 10. Now the Prophet had powerful grown men that would literally go and wash his feet for him. Why would he need 10-year-old children to be servants? But that's just a thought. But now let's just look at this, um, this, this, this character now, the second of the major hadith narrators. You know, there are seven major hadith narrators, the Sahabis that have produced or that have presented to the world Islam from their perspective. Now, let's just look at this Anas bin Malik, revered, eh? revered, greatly respected. You know, what I'm saying about this man will actually land me in great trouble in India and in Pakistan where people almost worship the Sahabis. And um, what, what can be said about this? Now I've got, let, let me point you to the site Ahlul Quran and what they say about this Anas bin what it says here, what it says here is that he outlived all the major companions. He was fond of wealth and fame and money. And uh, what Ahlul, the, the, the site says is that um, because he outlived all the companions, he, he did not hesitate making use, right? Those who were eager to hear did not stop for a moment to think that more than 70 years separate Anas bin Malik in Iraq and the prophets in, in, in Yathrib. So his memory was sharp for 70 years as he lived for almost a century after the prophet and during which time he was a, a child. Um, they were too eager to adapt to believe whatever Anas bin Malik would recount and he used his fame and stature to invest his narratives and make tons of money. Of course, such endeavors for wealth entail that Anas bin, bin Malik must flatter, obey and please Umayyad rulers and despots while overlooking their injustices and their, their grave injustices. The name of Anas bin Malik was never mentioned in any three historical accounts without successive wars and conquests committed once Muhammad died until Anas bin Malik died in Iraq. So he is not mentioned with any sort of um, acclaim um, regarding any major battle. So this man became a star under the Umayyads. He was never regarded as anything really mentionable during the time of the Prophet. He really became a star once he started speaking, or once he started acquiescing or agreeing to the Umayyad kings and serving their purpose by turning Islam into a, a pie-in-the-sky type of religion. You know, um, and, 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 and let me show you something else also that comes from a thesis, a work um, that is studied um, the role of Israeliyat or Jewish um, ideas and information entering Islam. Okay, so this is from a, th the title is this, uh, is actually Israeliyat and the emergence of the Baha'i interpretation of the Bible. Right, so it's not directly dealing with the topic, but um, it's a thesis written by Stephen N. Lambden. Uh, it is a registered thesis from Newcastle University Library. But there's some information that I want to draw out of here to show you the um, interaction between um, Anas bin Malik and uh, Jewish traditions and ideas. So on page 5 of this thesis, on page 4, we see the heading, um, Early Muslim Transmitters of Israeli Art, and it actually identifies those sources of Israeli art or Jewish ideas and um, concepts that have entered the fabric of Islam. And of course, as we are familiar with, the first that they identify is Abu Ishaq Kaab al-Akhbar, right? And that is who worked through um, Abu Huraira um, to actually introduce a lot of Jewish ideas in Islam. But the second one now, 
that I want to speak to you about for this video is Abdullah bin Salam al Harith, a Medinan Jew of Meccan origin. Abdullah bin Salam converted to Islam after the Hijrah. He is said to have aided Muhammad in obtaining correct bibliographical. Um, biblical information from the rabbi. So he was a rabbinical scholar. The prophet is said to have promised him a place in paradise, and that's obviously through the hadiths. To him are attributed books or, on magic and amulets, as well, for example, as traditions from the book of Daniel. Numerous Islamic Israeliat traditions originated with him. They were often relayed, here comes the key point, they were often relayed by the prolific traditionalist Anas bin Malik. They were often relayed by the prolific traditionalist Anas bin Malik. So what that says is that as with Abu Huraira, who was a student of Kaab al Anas bin Malik, the child Anas in Medina, who was 10 years old in Medina, who grew to be a man of 100 years old. He confused being in the company of Abdullah bin Salam, the Jewish rabbi or the Jewish learn, the, 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 the Jew of Mecca, of Medina. Right? This Jew became Muslim. Anas has learned and has taken a lot from him. Now comes the time of Anas serving the Umayyads, living in his palace being visited by thousands and thousands of people to speak about the Prophet 70 years after Medina, after the Prophet had died. We find the same Anas is now telling stories about the Prophet. And one of the most famous stories, one of the most famous stories of Anas is of course the story of the 50 Salahs, the 50 of the Prophet, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, you've all heard it some at some point in your madrasa or in your mosque or in a Friday sermon. The story of the Prophet ascending to the seventh heaven and being instructed to tell the believers to observe 50 times of prayer every day. Now that in itself is a ridiculous thought, 50 times a day. One salah takes you 20 minutes then uh, basically 50 times 20 minutes would uh, mean about 16 to 17 hours you would be busy in prayer. So the idea of 50 prayers is just a ridiculous idea. But in any case, that particular narration of the Prophet getting 50 prayers, then going down to the sixth heaven uh, where Moses um, actually then serves as the mentor or as the advisor to or to the Prophet Muhammad, where Moses then tells him, no, 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 you've got to go back and get it down from 50. It's way too, that's way too many. And then this debate ensues between God and Moses being the advisor to Muhammad. So you have the Jew telling Muhammad what to do and Muhammad is negotiating with the boss. Subhana wa, subhanallah wa na'uzu billah. We must seek refuge from Allah from believing this nonsense, this drivel. And this drivel, this nonsense, and Muslims will become upset if I tell them that this is drivel. But it, it, is, it points, it shows how they have started taking the religion for a joke. We know this hadith comes from Anas bin Malik. And I can show you something here about this hadith. Have a look at this. This is the, this is the hadith. This is the 50, the 50 Salah's hadith here. Right on, 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 on the side. It comes from Anas bin Malik once, twice, three times, four times. All of its sources lead back to Anas bin Malik. The story of Moses telling the Prophet to go back and go get a discount on his salahs and go back and get a discount and go back and get a discount every time. So it went from 50 to 12, 10 and then to 5, whatever the story was, right? So this this hadith is all of these times. It's in any case, you know, there's a bunch of weak people here. For example, Sharik, Nanqawi, not strong, Mudalli's inventor of hadith here, this one. 
So all of these are actually, if you look at them, they, they do actually point to weakness. But Anas bin Malik, Anas bin Malik is the common uh, narrator or the common feature in all of these. Narrates it from the Prophet. The strange story of the Prophet going and negotiating with um, Allah in terms of the Salah. Now that story, it reeks of Talmudism. You see, that story is exactly the type of story. If you read the Quran and you see how the Bani Israel sends their prophet back to go and ask Allah about the cow, you know, Surah Baqarah. How, what color must the cow be? You know, this debate, this, this argumentation with Allah. It's a, it's a Talmudic, it's an Israeli approach to dealing with the creator, or the divine creator of the universe. And here we see this hadith of the same type of go back, go back to Allah, ask him this, ask him that. It's a false invention. And it comes from Anas bin Malik. And Anas bin Malik, as I have shown you now, is the student is the student of Abdullah bin Salam al-Harith, the Jew of Medina, who was originally from Mecca, who invented these stories, uh, inventions of these Jews that were passed on to other Arab Sahabis, and that then was endorsed and blessed by the Umayyads and by the kings and by these corrupt imbeciles who wanted to turn Islam into a ridiculous religion and they invented all these nonsense stories for us. And here you are regarding this as most sacred, most religious. You will go to war defending these Jewish invent inventions in the deen of Islam. You know what? You, are, you, 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 you need to ask forgiveness and you need to really go and revise everything you have been taught about your dean.